Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Motor Writer Stand. And uh, you are about to hear some information you really, really won't hear anywhere else. This is um, exclusive stuff, and we're very proud to have two guys from the West Midlands Police here to tell us about the incidents of classic car theft and fakery and forgery. Now, sadly, one of the effects of having such a booming, bustling market and the high price of these cars is that there are people out there who like to steal them, to fake them, and to masquerade them as something they're not. And you've got to be very, very careful. With Aston Martin DB5s going on five, six hundred thousand pounds, there's an XK 150S Roadster over there that's four hundred thousand pounds. There's a lot of money in stealing and faking classic cars. So the question you all need answering is what can you do to protect your classic and what can you do to look for if you're about to buy one? So I have with me Paul Ennis and Mark Weaver from West Midlands Police um, and you're presumably the stolen car squad, sort of? Not exactly the stolen car, the car squad. I'm a stolen vehicle examiner. I'm Paul Ennis, um, as Quinton mentioned, and my colleague Mark Weaver. Um, Many forces now don't have specific uh, stolen vehicle squads, unfortunately, anymore. So the officers have gone back out and they're working on other teams and other crews. Tell us how big, Mark, the, the, the classic car theft thing is. Classic cars pre-86. Bring the microphone up a bit, yeah. Classic cars pre-86, you're looking at outstanding from a year ago, is about a thousand cars, just short of. A thousand cars a year? A thousand cars. And what break those down? What are the most popular things that people make? We had a, a spike in 2012 of, I think it was 72 classic minis, and that's what really opened uh, our eyes to the uh, to the problem of classic vehicles being stolen. So minis, uh, Mark One Escorts? It, it varies, it could be anything from your Aston Martins right down to your minis. It, it just varies, some for parts. Um, and so they're sold, broken up for parts, but are some of them sold complete? Some of them are sold complete with false IDs. Some just broken down for bits. And the big problem for a consumer is that if they buy a car that has been stolen and the insurance company has paid out on it, technically they don't have legal title to that car, do they? And they can lose it. The, the vehicle is always owned by the insurance company in that case. So if they've paid out. you've really got to do due diligence to avoid losing all that money and having to fight for it back in the court and you might not even get it. That's right, that's correct, yes. So we've got issues with V5Cs, haven't we? Now, this is a V5C, every car, new or old, should have one. But I'm looking at these, tell me what, what, what is wrong with them. A couple of these V5 documents are completely fake. Um, they've never come out of Swansea at all. They're complete reprints that somebody has made to a very high standard, including some of the security features on them. So unless you know exactly what you're looking at, it's very easy to be duped by some of these documents. See, sorry, let me try. I would look at this. I mean, instantly the paper feels different, but it is pretty good. Has it got watermarks? Yeah, no, this one hasn't got watermarks. But to, to a casual observer, this is, this is pretty good stuff. Oh yeah, if you were looking at a vehicle that was a good deal uh, and That's you were interested in, yeah. in purchasing it, these documents would be, uh, on the side of the road, very, very difficult to identify as false or stolen documents. See, this would fool me. And is this one of those ones that was stolen, the blanks that were stolen from the DVLA? That is one of those, yeah, one of the, what we call Operation Drift. That relates to that incident where the, the documents were stolen on the way to destruction. So tell the audience here about blue log books and red log books, because that's important, isn't it? It is. The, the whole idea of the red log books was to supersede the blue ones um, to help people identify vehicles that might be stolen. So you should have all had a red document through by now to replace the old blue one. And it's the red documents that should be passed on with the vehicles. Although I would say if I was purchasing a second-hand vehicle, I would expect the purchaser to supply the blue and the red document. There's no reason for them to throw the blue away. And it just gives a little bit more provenance to that vehicle if they've got both. Another issue is that old cars don't have the security features of modern cars, and they're very easy to falsify with VIN plates and chassis numbers and engine numbers. Just, Paul, talk us through what you've got there. Here, you, you're all more than welcome to come and have a look afterwards. There's a couple of questions that I will answer no. I won't tell you where I got them. I know they're not for sale, so don't offer to buy them off me. 
Um, what I've got here is some fake uh, VIN plates and some documentation, a false tax disc and some other bits and pieces if you want to come and have a look at those afterwards, you're more than welcome to. Some of these were taken off vehicles that we recovered that were stolen and some of the new plates were bought um, by myself off the internet. And they're very simple to do, aren't they? I mean, you can buy a Jaguar plate, you can buy a mini plate, you can buy British Leyland plates, you can even buy uh, high-value cars like Aston Martins and Ferrari plates and then get them stamped up. And they're just attached by pop rivets, aren't they? Yes, yeah, some are pop rivets and some are merely stuck on. Um, some look as though they've got rivets on them, but they're adhesive and they just stick onto the vehicle, so they don't look as though they've been tampered with once they're fitted. You really know what to... So you really need to know what to look for on the plates, what security features are on there. The beauty of the internet for us as consumers is that we can check what the plate should look like, maybe even print that off if we're going to look at a vehicle and compare that to the one that's fitted to it, so we should have some idea or not to its authenticity. It's a very good point you make there that, OK, we can't all be familiar with the particular type of chassis plate for a particular type of car, but it is out there on Google put in, you know, VIN plate for Aston Martin DB4 and then press images and you will see all these plates that owners clubs and things have recorded so you've got a chance of familiarising yourself to see what a proper, proper VIN plate looks like and you stand a reasonable chance of, of detecting any obvious forgeries. That's absolutely right and it's not just what the plate looks like but it's also the font, whether it's stamped, is it engraved, is it dot matrix that form the letters, there's several things you can check on there which will give you a better understanding of what you're looking at when you're going to look at the vehicle you're potentially going to purchase. So what advice would both of you give to people who are looking at buying a classic car, potentially a high value one, and to make sure that it is bona fide and genuine? A couple of quick points, um, try not to go and part with cash, I know that cash is a, a currency that we use in this country, but if it's several thousand pounds and they only want a cash deal, that would raise my concerns. Secondly, I would go to an address where you know that the person either lives or works, don't buy it from a pub car park or something like that. And where the address is on the V5C as well, it's always really good to meet the person at the home address which is on the V5C. Yeah, and that can be backed up with uh, utility bills and things like that in their name to that address. So. As much as you can do, really, but the one thing that I think is a real good uh, point to do, we all have smartphones now, I would suggest, before you close the deal and part with your hard-earned pension fund or whatever it is that you're going to use, is just say to them that you want to take the photo with the car. You'll get a reaction to that. If they don't want the photo taken, as good as the deal is, I would be tempted to walk away. That's a really, really good idea. You just casually say, oh, it's a lovely car. I want a nice photograph of the previous owner for the service history. Get your phone out, and if they run a mile, you know they're double dodgy. Potentially. Potentially, okay. <laughs> so, um, forged tax discs, now that's no longer an issue, is it? No, um, obviously as of last month we don't have tax discs anymore, but the good thing about tax discs, especially on a classic vehicle, it will show provenance because people tend to hang on to the discs. So you can always ask to see previous tax discs and that people will often save them. Um, or elsewhere, so they do give an air of provenance to the vehicle. And that's another good point. The more documentation you have with the classic car, the more folders of service history and old tax disc and automotives, the more likely it is to be genuine. Because because forging that level of stuff, I mean, it happens, but it doesn't happen often. So documentation is king, and that's why motoriety is such a good idea because you can put all this stuff virtually um, and digitally up in a, a, a virtual hangar like the cloud and you've got it there. So if the owner is volunteering all this information saying, look, I've got my motoriety service history or here's a big ring binder of stuff, you, you know that 90% chance that that's going to be a genuine car. Okay, so what about leaving your car, parking your car, protecting it from, from being stolen? What are the, the obvious things that's going to put someone off? I think the first thing, if you can keep your classic vehicle stored inside a building or something like that, so it's out of sight, is the first obvious thing to do. Um, criminal networks will often work off a shopping list and they will target specific vehicles, whatever they are. So if you can keep your vehicle out of sight, out of sight is out of mind, as my old grandma used to say, that's the first thing I would do. As Quentin mentioned, there's, there's not many security features on the older vehicles. 
Um, whatever you can add to them is all the better. So there's all sorts of systems you can add to the vehicle to mark them and identify that to the criminal network because then they will know that the vehicle is almost too hot to handle if it's covered in um, a secondary marking system or something like that. It's a bit too hot to handle if they break it down into parts. Um, in, in domestic residences you have this thing called smart water where you coat your, your possessions with this stuff will come up with an infrared uh, torch. But we've also got that now for classic cars, haven't we? What's it, what's it called? There's one here at the show called Selector Mark, but there are several other companies in the market doing a similar thing. I don't want to promote any particular brand. But Selector Mark are here. You can go and have a word with them today, and I'm sure they'll be able to give you all the ins and outs on it. But tell us about that, because that's microdots, isn't it? It is. It's a microdot system that's affixed to the vehicle. There's thousands of microdots. Um, fixed to the vehicle with a glue that um, we can detect using some other equipment. So what we do is we go over the vehicle, we try and find the glue, we can then remove the micro dots and read them under a microscope, there's a unique number on them, um, which will be cross-referenced back to that vehicle. So that's after the event, you might get a chance of getting your car back, um, but it's stopping people stealing it. So are there any security devices that you look at through the window and you think, no, I'm not going to have a go at that, I'm going to walk on and find something else. What would you, as, as, as serving officers who, 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 who deal with these things every day, what would you recommend the average classic car renter to fit as a, as a visually useful deterrent to theft? That's a good question. I don't but it's, wanna... it's one that needs answering. It is one that needs answering. There are lots of... Um items on the market, there are lots of things that go on the steering wheel, um, pedal boxes that lock the pedals in so people can't get them off. Um, anything that's high vis which makes that particular vehicle look a bit more difficult than the one further down the road will send the criminal down the road. The only thing I would say is make sure that you buy something of a reasonable quality, so something that's been tested, something like Thatcher approved or something like that, that you know it's not made of plasticine or something that's going to fall to bits the minute the criminal attacks it. So it needs to have some resilience against being attacked. So something that's Thatcher approved um, and proven to be able to withstand some abuse is the thing that you need. And talk us through how this happens. Do they go around with low loaders and just pull the car off or do they expect to drive it away? It's both really. Um, it depends on the location of the vehicle. Sometimes they have to be driven away because if they're in a building or something like that, they need to drive it out. But they will use low loaders, uh, lorries with high abs, containers, um, all sorts of things. I mean, motorcycles will be pushed into the back of transit vans and that sort of thing and taken away. So the methodology is quite wide depending on the physical security around the vehicle and where it is. But you can, for instance, take your lead off your fuel pump or your main HD lead off or have a, a battery kill switch, which just makes it that little bit more difficult, doesn't it? Yeah, and anything that you can do to make it more difficult has got to be worth doing. Don't give the criminals an easy ride. At the end of the day, what they're trying to do is make a fast buck at your expense. So whatever you can do to make life a bit more difficult for them, I would suggest doing that. Take care, take pains, park it carefully, lock it up, and understand what a good chassis number looks like and a bad one. And please give our heroes from the West Midlands Police a round of applause. Thank you very much, guys. Keep up the good work.